I've been reminded multiple times, y'all's giving statements are back there in the foyer. There's a little table back there that's got them on there. And uh, y'all be, be sure to get them. The other day they was talking about that many of them were still back there. There was a, several of them still back there. So uh, y'all be sure to grab them this morning. Isaiah chapter 53. Last week we were talking about the servant Jesus and how he is going to come and he is going to restore he is going to redeem. He is going to do something absolutely incredible. But there's, there's something about him um, that don't make good sense. Because you would think that when the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the creator of all the earth come down to earth, that he would be accepted. You would think that somebody that wanted to do something good for all of us, that wants to grow God's kingdom, would be accepted, right? That wants to do something incredible, would be accepted. But remember what we talked about last week. He came down, and he didn't just come down to earth. He come down amongst his own people, the Bible says. Listen to what he says over there in verse 3 again. It says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid as if it were our faces from him. And he was despised. And then here's the, here's the key right here. And we esteemed him not. In other words, we didn't help him. We didn't try to see if he was okay. We left him laying there in all this pain and all this sorrow, and we did nothing about it. Y'all, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to pick on Miss Angie this morning because she said something in Sunday school that was pretty awesome. And she said she had listened to Priscilla Shire the other day, and Priscilla brought up a thing about the shield, putting on the armor of God and the shield. And what Priscilla said was, is the shield, the Bible teaches, that it is to protect us from the fiery darts. And, and these fiery darts have a purpose. All right, notice they're not just darts, but they're fiery darts. And what is this fiery dart going to do? It is going to begin to set fires all around you. Because then as you turn around to start putting out these fires, you are now not keeping focus on the enemy. You see that? The enemy will put things around you in life. He don't have to hit you. He's just got to distract you. He's just got to get your eyes off the battle. That's all he's got to do. All that you ever need is a clear, clean shot. That's all you need. And all the enemy needs right now is a clear, clean shot. All he wants you to do is be distracted. But in the same breath, there's a reason why you're trying to put these fires out. Because these fires, you're trying to protect the most precious things that you have in life. Your family. And them fires are around them. And you are trying to protect them. And this shield, if it don't catch them, is going to create some problems. You see, but here's something else that we got to understand. Just like Jesus. Listen to me. If, if Jesus come to earth right now, think about this for just a second. If Jesus, everybody says, oh, we need Jesus. Oh, we need Jesus, Right? What do you think would happen if, if Jesus came to earth right now? A lot of us would love him, and a lot of people would hate him. And then there's a lot in between that say, I don't know. That's what we're dealing with in this world. A lot of people like us know we don't just need him. We crave him. We want him. We got to have him as a part of our life. But the rest of them over there are thinking, nah. I think he's just overrated. And, and, here's, and here's what's happening right here. What we don't realize. Notice what the Bible teaches us. It teaches us about the armor of God. It teaches about the sword and the shield. Listen, that's not what you put on your kids to go play on the playground. We're not going to the playground to play, y'all. We're going to war with the enemy. Jesus said he come to kill, steal, and then here's the ultimate blow, destroy. He wants to destroy everything about us. He wants to destroy everything about you. He wants to make you look stupid. He wants to make you look like a fool. He wants to destroy us. 
And he even did it to our own Savior. Why won't he do it to us? Listen, listen to this. This is God's word about Jesus. Seven, eight hundred years before Jesus ever come. It says, he is despised and rejected of men. John 1 tells us that he was despised of his own people. He come amongst his own people. And they despised him. Do you know that Isaiah chapter 53 in Judaism is considered the forbidden chapter? We don't talk about this man. Because there was a man named Jesus that looked a lot like him. Duh! But listen what he said. He was despised. And he was rejected of me, a man of sorrows. Listen what verse 4 goes to tell us again. I know what we're talking about some of last week, but listen to what it's saying. I'm leading up to what we're getting to this morning. He says, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He came with a purpose. And then all this right here. Now here's the key. You can beat him, you can hate him, you can despise him, you cannot help him. You know what he's going to do about you? Look right here. Go down, go down to verse 7 now. Look what he's going to do. You can, you can say whatever you want about him. You can hate him. You can call him out in crowds. Listen what he says. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did what? Open not his mouth. He opened not his mouth. You see, I, I, here's the thing. They didn't know the truth. They didn't know what he was doing. They didn't know the purpose. But here's the thing. They didn't want to listen to it either. They didn't want it. You've got to want it. You've got to want Look, There's a very valuable lesson to hear from Jesus right here. And notice when I say to listen to Jesus right here. What are we listening to? See, that's the thing about the Bible a lot of times. It ain't what you read. It's what you, you're like, hold on, hold on. He didn't say nothing. Remember when they were beating him? Remember when they were questioning him? Remember when they were hating on him and railing on him? And saying, right, if you're Messiah, say something, do something, do a, do a prophecy. What did he do? Nothing. If, if he did anything, here's what he said. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know what he did? He prayed for them. He prayed for them. Y'all, I'm going to tell you right here, listen. We, there's a very, 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 very valuable lesson to learn right here. When you are despised and you are rejected and when you are hated among people, you got one of two choices. You can make them look like crap or try to. Or you can keep your mouth shut and you can let God fight for you. L listen, as a matter of fact, let me give you something. Another verse in another chapter, just one over. Go to Isaiah 54, verse 17. Flip over just one chapter. Listen what it says. He says this. He says, no weapon that is formed against thee shall proper. This kind of sounds like your favorite verse, Miss Pam. And every tongue, here you go, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of servants, of the servants of the Lord. Listen to what he says. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Your righteousness is not in you and how you can plead your case. Your righteousness is in the Lord. And it don't matter what anybody says about you. You can say whatever you want about me. I can say whatever I want about you. It don't matter. What does God think about us? That's what matters. I'm going to tell you something right now. The worst, there's a whole chapter on, I don't know I'm talking about. A tongue. It is powerful. Words, powerful. And Jesus Hanging on the cross gave us a perfect example of what it can do. And, and let me tell you something right now. If there are people running their mouth and there's people gossiping, let me tell you something about those loose lips. Those loose lips that are bashing somebody else will have your name in them next. I, loose lips don't discriminate. 
Loose lips just want to be loose. And they want to run and they want to talk. And Jesus said right here, you keep your mouth shut. You seek me, you trust me, you praise me, and you let me do the fighting. You let me fight for you. That's all you need. You know, the Bible clearly tells us Jesus sees all and Jesus knows all, but most of all, Jesus knows our hearts. And, amen, brother. And right here, here's what he's doing. He's telling them, he's saying, look, these people are oppressing me. These people are afflicting me. And what they don't know is I know them and I love them so much. I'm not going to give up on them. That's what he's saying. Matter of fact, now look with me as he goes to verse 8. He says, he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. You see that? And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. That's what Jesus said. Jesus done nothing wrong, but yet he was buried. He died for us. Neither was there any deceit in his mouth. You know, it is really strange to me. And it's really, really kind of eye-opening to me that it keeps making a point about what he did or didn't say in this moment. Do you see that? He is, and it does it again right there. But it's also not just saying what he didn't say and not just talking about all this, but it's also saying what he was willing to do for us. How low he was willing to go for us. Because now here comes a verse right here that honestly don't make a lot of sense. That, that don't make good sense to a lot of people, but it, yet it does. Listen what it says in verse 10. Verse 10 is really the key verse this morning. Listen what he says. He says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Hold on a minute. Wait 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 a minute. You mean to tell me God was happy to watch Jesus go through this? Listen what he says. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. You know, a lot of people really struggle with this verse right here. God was happy that Jesus died on the cross. God is happy that we are getting, uh, uh, that we're beating Jesus and, and that when Jesus is bleeding from every orifice of his body and, and he's carrying his cross and, and he's crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God is okay with this and God is pleased with this? No, let me tell you what God is. Y'all, I'm going to tell you something right now. It don't make good sense, and it never will. But God is willing to let you go through something that is going to literally break you to get you where He wants you. Do y'all hear me right now? Listen to this right now. No, God would have never put Jesus through this. But we needed him badly. And this moment right here, for this, this, this few days right here of all this pain and all this stuff, you can actually go all the way back for the 33 years he was on earth. Because I'm going to be honest with you, living on earth sometimes ain't a cakewalk. Can I get amen? amen. So, so living on earth is, is bad enough, leaving the throne of heaven. But then these, these next few days where they take him, and they beat him, and they spit on him, and they slap him in the face. I told y'all that's kind of where I, I, I kind of, I, I, can do, I can take a lot. Don't hit me in the face. Don't open palm slap me. You know what I mean? The only person that's ever got away with open palm slapping me was my mama. And she could have done it a hundred times, and I would have never raised a hand to her. Amen. You don't mess with mama. But anyways, but one of y'all, we fighting, all right? I'm just letting you know. But here's the point. They slap him. They spit in his face. They mock him and they curse him so bad that God could not even look on him. That Jesus said, my God, you know that God, I believe God and Jesus walked so close. They were so close. That when God was so hurt and when
when that sin on Jesus was so devastating and it was so real and it was so painful that God said, I can't take no more. I can't, I can't, I'm sorry, son. I, I, I love you and I am so proud of you, but I can't right now. And he turned away for just a moment. And that's when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Y'all, our lives are ugly. And, and we do a good job of messing some things up. We have done a great job of making a big mess. So big a mess that we were not able to clean it up. And in this moment, God said, He said, Son, I am so proud of you. But this is the hardest thing I've ever had to watch in my life, watching you go through this. But yet, he wouldn't stop it because he knew when Jesus said, it is finished. What was fixing to come? You know, I, I think, of course, we wasn't there. I think for a split second when he said, it is finished, there was this eerie silence. Because here's something that had to happen. He, had, he gave up the ghost and it was over and then it was just like, if you've ever watched somebody die, I don't recommend it, but I have done it, all right? It's weird. It's this weird, and you, you're like, are they really gone? And, and, and you, you know they are. And that's right. And you're watching it and you're just, you're, you're taking it in and then you watch Jesus on that cross and then there's this eerie silence. Like, now what? And then the rumbling. And then the Bible says the veil in the temple ripped. And all these things were happening. But God, in this moment, it, He had to get through this moment. Let me tell y'all something right now. This moment don't last forever. I don't know how long it's going to last. And I don't know how painful it's going to be. And I don't know how deep you're going to have to go. And how, how, I don't know. But I'm telling you, it don't last forever. Forever. You, let me tell you what happens in these times. You find a prayer life you didn't even know you had. You cry out to God and those scriptures start coming from everywhere. You feel God's presence in your life. You find out how much He really loves you in this moment. You seek him in these moments. Let me tell you something. It is not pleasing God to see you go through this. What's pleasing God is going to be the different you on the back side of this. Because you are going to be stronger. You are going to be better. And just like Jesus right here, something great is coming out of this moment. But this moment has to happen. Or we ain't got no hope today, y'all. If Jesus said in this moment, I can't do this, Dad, I'm sorry. You know what? This wouldn't even exist. You might as well go prepare to watch the Super Bowl because that's going to be your joy for the day. Some of y'all got your Taylor Swift boyfriend shirts already, I know. <laughs> Stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. But, but that's, that's what you would have to look forward in this world. All the things that are real, the real life, the real joy, the real peace, the real hope. I told them people in Sunday school just a little while ago, I said, y'all know what? We should have the greatest faith in the history of the earth. You know why? They didn't have this. How many of y'all got a verse you cling to in your deepest, darkest moments? Come on, lift your hands. You got certain verses, certain spots marked in your Bible that you go to. That is your anchor when times get tough. And then when you read moments like this in the Bible, you know that Jesus fulfilled all of this. So you know this is real. And for the last probably two, three hundred years, they've had publishing to the point that people could personally own a Bible. The funny thing is most of them couldn't even read or write. So having a Bible a lot of times wasn't even no good because you couldn't read it. But then we not only have the Bible... We have the Word of God at access. We see these things already fulfilled. 90% of what is in this book has been fulfilled. 
There's probably 10% left to go. The seven-year tribulation, a thousand-year millennial reign, and eternal kingdom. That's what's left. We are at the end. The rest of it has already been fulfilled. We should have the greatest faith the earth has ever seen. Because we know He's real. And His book tells us He's real. And His book is proving it. Archaeologists are proving it. Israel over there, everything they're finding over there is proving it. We should have the greatest faith this earth has ever seen. And when we're going through these deepest, darkest moments in our life, it's not because... It's not because God said, hey, let me see if I can pick on you today. You ain't been picked on in a while. It's because God's got something great for you. God's going to do something great for you. God is not done with you. Y'all want to know something about John the Pike? John the Pike didn't just come to Woodland Baptist Church. John the Pike wasn't just called to come to Woodland Baptist Church. God sent John the Pike to Woodland Baptist Church. You know the Bible? Listen, this ain't Jonathan. Jonathan was a construction worker. Jonathan was fine and happy doing what he was doing. And you know what? Here's what God said. God told me, he said, Jonathan, you're going to preach. And then here's what he says in his own word. He says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun this good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.6. You want to know something about that? God has put a work in your life. And not even the gates of hell can stop it. Oh, it's going to try. But it can't stop you because you don't control what God's done for you. You just got to say, I won't quit and I won't give up. Let me tell you something. God might have me here today and somewhere else tomorrow, but that's what God's going to do. Not Jonathan, not you, not anybody else. God will lead and He will guide you, but let me tell you what He's also going to do. He's going to put you through some things in life so that He can get a better side of you when it's all said and done. Let me tell you right here, listen what He's saying. Being, uh, go back to Isaiah 53, verse 10. It pleased the Lord to bruise Him. It pleased God because you know what God could see? God could see today. See, we couldn't see today. Our pre-planning, how many, of you, how many of you have got to plan out every day of your week this week, huh? How many of you already got your week planned out? How many of you got your Google Calendar filled up with all kind of events and things going on? Amy is constantly, I'm, I'm sitting there on my phone and go, bling, bling. I'm like, what in the world? Oh boy, here we go. She lives by that thing nowadays. I remember the good old days where you had to break out in your checkbooks that little planner. Remember that? No, we got phones now that keeps up with all that stuff. And, and here's what's happened. You have plans. You've got your day planned out. And then you know what God does? He starts laughing. <laughs> hey, that ain't what you're doing. That's <laughs> what you thought you was doing. I got plans for you. I got a purpose for you. And if you won't quit, I'll take you some places. We're going to do some things. We're going to have the time of the life doing it. We are going to help people. And we're going to change people's lives. We are. I'm going to use you to do that. Now, another th something that, that absolutely tickles me. I told Jeff Brown, me and him pick at each other because we, we joke saying we're the two biggest dummies that ever walked. But then the Bible, and I told him our, our motto of life and our encouragement verse is this, that God uses the foolish things. God uses the dummies. To confound the wise. God uses us. You say, I'm not able and I'm not capable and I can't do this. It's not up to you. You just got to say, where do you want me to go, God? What do you want me to do, God? I'm yours. And then watch God do something incredible with you. Listen, go on right here. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him because he had a plan for him, y'all. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. It says, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Verse 11. He shall see of the travail of his soul. And shall be satisfied. Y'all, I'm going to tell you. that this The veil in the temple 
many years, uh, quite a few years ago, we was going through the book of Hebrews. Some of y'all might remember that. And the veil in the temple, I, I always, you know, when you grow up in church like I did, you learn about the tabernacle, all right? For whatever reason, when we are kids in, in school back then, preschool and uh, uh, Bible school and all that, all we talked about was the tabernacle, really. We never really talked about the temple a whole lot. It was all about the tabernacle. But within this tabernacle is the veil. Y'all know the veil. And the veil was thought to be about six inches thick of garments. Heavy. Just unbelievably heavy. 30 feet in length. I mean, this unbelievable cloth that stretched. And here's what it did. It separated the, the tabernacle or the temple. It separated the main area there from the Holy of Holies. From where the Ark of the Covenant sit. And so let, let's say right here where these steps are. That back there is the Holy of Holies. And the priests and, and others could enter into here and they could offer up. And they, they had table incense and table show bread and, and all that stuff is in there. And then once a month this priest would go in and he had bells around his feet. And for the longest time, it took me a long time to find that in the Bible. Anyway, it's in there. He had bells around his feet and he would go in to the Holy of Holies. And he would enter in and he'd go up here to the, where the Ark of the Covenant was and he would take the blood of the Lamb that was shed for you and me. And if he went in there unclean, the Bible says that he would fall dead. But he would walk into the Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle the blood on top of the mercy seat there on top of the ark for our a remission of our sins. And he would do this for the people. And then they started doing it like this. Well, I think I'm going to sin a little extra today. Y'all get the fat lamb. We need some extra blood. In other words, they started doing all these works to try to cover their sin. But there was no repenting. There was no, I'm sorry. There was no genuineness behind it. And then God comes to him and he says, Look, y'all are wasting lambs. You're wasting these animals. Because I'm not happy with the shedding of the blood that's going on right now. I see your heart. And it's not genuine. So then here's what happens. When Jesus comes, notice what John said about him. I think it's John chapter 1, verse 29. He says, Behold the Lamb of God that came to take away the sins of the earth. And so then here's what happens. In this moment that we're listening to right now and we're hearing, only the high priest could go in to God. Only the high priest had access to to talk to God and make remission of sin. Only the high priest did. But then Jesus came. And then here's the key to the Bible, y'all. The Bible says when Jesus said, It is finished. Notice what the next verse in the Gospels are. The veil in the temple ripped from top to bottom. Signifying two things. Number one, it's impossible for us to rip that veil. You couldn't have ripped it with a chainsaw. You sure can't rip it with no pair of scissors or, or a knife or nothing like that. And then you would have to have ladders and scaffolding to get up to the top first. But the veil ripped from top to bottom all the way down, wide open. Signaling two things. Number one, that Jesus has removed anything that keeps us from God. Praise God. Y'all didn't hear me right there. Jesus just removed anything that keeps us from God. Amen. Do y'all realize this? You don't have to come to the priest to talk to God. You don't have to go to the temple to talk to God. We got access to God. I don't care where we're at. We have, there's nothing keeping us from God. He tore it wide open. He took the barrier down. He shed his blood so that we have access to the Father. 
Can you imagine years and years and years having your children over there and you're over here and there's a wall between y'all? Some of y'all are like, that'd be actually kind of nice for a little while. So maybe get a little peace and quiet, finally get some things done, clean house, you know. But, but here's what it is. There, there's a barrier between you and your child. And they are crying out and they're saying, I need you, I need you, please. Help! They're screaming out, I need you. And you can't get to them. You know why? It's, it's like this with, with God. Y'all remember when we were kids? Some of y'all are like, man, that was a long time ago, brother. Hold on a minute. <laughs> remember when we were kids and we would play outside? These kids, they don't know nothing about that. But we would play outside. And notice, you know how you can tell when you're getting old? Instead of going into mud puddles, you dodge them. That's how you know you're getting old. Because when I was a kid, I'm like, well, look at that one. It's like a big swimming pool right there, you know? But then you get old and you're like, man, is there a way I can get around that? And you're like, yeah, I'm old. But remember when we were kids and we used to go try to find the biggest, nastiest, muddiest mud puddles? And we would play in them things and we'd waller in them things like a pig. We'd put pigs to shame. We'd waller in them so bad. Matter of fact, I was joking one time. This might be TMI, but I'm going to tell you. When I hit middle school... I remember we used to wear them tidy whities Y'all know what I'm talking about. And all mine were brown. From swimming in the lakes and playing in the mud puddles. And we had to change clothes when you get in middle school. You know, you go to PE in middle school and they make you change out. And I told my mom, I need some new underwear. You know what I mean? All mine were brown. But you, you, remember, you remember when we played in them mud puddles. And then we'd come up and we got that stuff in our hair. Remember that sand and that grit all in our hair. And be in our ears. You take a bath and three days later you still pull the mud out behind your ears. And before you could come in that front door, mama say, don't you come in my house like that, boy. You go out there and hose off with the hose pipe. You're like, mama, that thing's cold. I don't care. You ain't coming in my house like that. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But let me tell you. God's wanting to get to us. But he is so pure. And he is so holy. Don't you come in my house like that. You can't step foot in here like that. You stay outside. I got something coming. It's red. And it come from my son. And it's going to take you. And it's going to turn you white as snow. You see, I don't know if some of y'all saw this the other day. The Mona Lisa. There was a bunch of protesters. Global warming finna kill us all. They're so stupid. If they just read the Bible, they know we got another thousand years. Everything's going to be okay, all right? <laughs> but but they, they're, the Mona Lisa was right there, and they was wanting to protest. So they go throw and waste a bunch of soup and throw soup all over the Mona Lisa, what they was trying to do. But what's so stupid is the Mona Lisa's in this case. It's about six inches or a foot thick. They can't touch that thing. But see, that's God. You try to throw your nastiness at God, but it can't touch God. He's so pure, and He's so holy. There is no spot. There is no blemish. There is no marks in our God. And then in this moment, He sent His Son so that we can get access back to Him. And so then here's what Jesus did. He took that blood. And he took all that filth and he cleaned us up. Remember when mama said, all right, that's good enough. You can come on in. And we would come in and we'd go get a shower. But God would look at us. The difference is when you come in this time, you are pure and holy. God has cleaned you up. And that's why he says right here, he is satisfied with your life. He is satisfied. Because of Jesus and what Jesus just did for you. He just cleaned you up. And he just made you to where you can have access to the Father. Notice one last thing right here though. Go down. Here's, here's what's so sad about this. Listen to the rest of the verse right there. Verse 11. He said, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. With what Jesus did. And then here's, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant. Here's, and here's one of the saddest statements in the Bible right here. 
by the righteousness shall my servant justify excuse me many. Now why don't it say all right there? I'll tell you why. Because not all of us are going to choose him. Ain't that terrible? Ain't that terrible? That God would send his son and that God would let his son go through all this agony and all this pain and all this suffering because we are so filthy and we are crying out, I need you, God. And then God says, all right, just hold on one minute and I'm going to make a way. And then he says, all right, it's paid in full. Just come on in. You got to accept it. And then we're standing outside and we're like, you know, I've been thinking about it. I think I'm good. I think I'm going to try to fix this on my own. I think I'm going to try to make this right on my own. And you see what's happening right here? You know why people are going to hell? Because they don't think they need Jesus. And right here, notice what it says. He goes on to tell us right here. He says, justify many. Wouldn't it be great if it said he had justified all? But you know, here's the, here's the problem. We would either, one, have to be like robots. In other words, we take commands and we're forced to accept him. But you know what the difference is? You've got free will this morning. Somebody say, well, I ain't got no free will. I ain't got no choice. My wife told me I had to wear this. Well, that's your fault. I can't help you there. I'm kidding. You've got free will. You wore what you wanted to wear. You're going to go eat what you want to eat. You're going to do whatever you want to do. You've got free will. And now you've got to make a choice. But I'm going to tell you something. Our choices don't just start and end at salvation. Our choices are lifelong choices, y'all, that we've got to make daily. We've got to choose Jesus daily. Now, we're saved one time. I'll give you that. We are. But remember what I told you when we started. We ain't going to the playground today. We're going to war. So you better be prepared for war every day. The Bible says the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, seeking for the day that you take off. For the day that you don't have your guard up. For the day that you are exposed. He is looking for you. Notice how lions in, in the wild, they're, they're smart enough to know, I'm not going for the big ones in, in, in the middle of the pack. I'm going for the one that got distracted and is over here all by itself. Or the weak, that's right, or the babies. And that's going to be you if you're not ready. He's seeking whom he may devour. Notice right here. He goes on. Let's finish. Let's, let's read this last verse. Verse 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bared the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And so now here's what I want to do when we close. Notice what he did. He, he, he was numbered with many. He bore the sin of the transgressors. And then here's what he also did. Y'all know what he did. He gave the gospel to us. Now what is the gospel? I can tell you one thing. It's the good news. How many of y'all just need some good news nowadays? Just about every one of us. That's right. So now here's what you got. What is this good news? Let me, let, let's break it down in a few of the words right here. Number one, grace. What is grace? I like the acronym for it, and I know that's a big word for even me, acronym, but I learned something new, so y'all ought to be proud of me. <laughs> Listen to this acronym. Grace, God's riches at... Christ's expense. We have access to the riches of heaven through Jesus Christ. Now, listen to it like this. This is the biblical definition of grace. Grace is the basis for the Christian faith. 
We believe we are saved by faith through grace. God's grace is usually defined as undeserved favor. In other words, you don't deserve it. None of us deserve it. But Jesus loves us. And Jesus wants to give us something that we don't deserve, we can't earn, and that we can't pay for. Listen to what he goes on to say. He says, we count on God's grace and the bridge He built and our relationship with Him. Now that's grace. Listen to do another. Mercy. What is mercy? The biblical definition of mercy is this. Mercy appears in the Bible as it relates to forgiveness and, or without holding punishment. For example, God the Father showed mercy on us when He sacrificed His Son, Christ Jesus, on the cross to pay the price for our sins, not His sins. You see, we need, we, we're supposed to pay for what we've done. But you know what mercy says? I'm going to pay for it. Look what uh, love is. What is love? Love is unconditional. Many of you, here's the thing about love that's so funny to me. Love is what a lot of us pour out and show we're great at it with our kids. But when it comes to our marriage or to other people, we struggle. And here's what I mean. You will love your child. I don't care what they do. I don't care who they hurt. I don't, I don't care how bad they embarrass you. How I many of y'all got kids that just laugh and embarrass you sometimes? Y'all remember, I remember there was a certain time when the kids were real small. We re, would not go out to eat in a restaurant. They would slap and embarrass us. Me and y'all been there. Y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. They be hollering and hooting and screaming and climbing all over the benches and you're afraid they're going to flip over and the people behind you. And so here's, here's what it is. But yet you've got patience with them. You keep loving them. You keep providing for them. And you would never give up on them. You know what love is. Listen to what the Bible says here. More than anything, the Bible makes it clear that God is love. 1 John 4, 8. He isn't just loving, but He is the very definition of love. He loves us because He created us. His affection is unconditional. I don't care how old you are, and I don't care what you've done, and I don't care where you've been, and I don't care who you know, and I don't care, I don't care, and I don't care, and I don't care. God still loves us. Every single one of us. Amen, brother. Listen when he goes on right here. He both generates and demonstrates love. And that love endures forever. Let me tell you something about love. You don't just cut it on and off like a switch. That's not love. When you love somebody, you love them no matter what. You love them no matter what they've said. You know, no, matter, no matter what they've done. You love them no matter whatever. You love them. Like I said, we're great at showing this to our kids. But we really struggle to show it to each other. We really struggle to show it to our own spouses especially. We run real slim and slack on grace and mercy and love. And then here's the next one, the biggest one, forgiveness. We want to hold grudges. We want to keep score. We want to say, oh, I forgive you. That is thrown out so loosely now. I forgive you. Okay, then never talk about it again because that's what forgiveness means. It's done, it's over, it's gone. That's what forgiveness means. It, forgiveness is this. Listen to what Colossians 3, 12 and 13 says. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels and of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering. Here we go, verse 13. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, even uh, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, also do you. Let me, let me ask you something. If somebody steals, flat out steals $20 from you, and, and then they come to you and they apologize and they say, oh, I'm so sorry, please. I, I, I don't know what I was thinking and I'm so sorry, please. I, I don't. Can you forgive me? Yeah, I forgive you, but I want my $20 back. That's not forgiveness. 
That's not forgiveness. What if somebody's just running their mouth about you and you find out about it? It's not forgiveness if you do not truly forgive. Y'all, the hardest thing we will ever do in this life is sometimes forgive and love unconditionally and show mercy. Some of the hardest things we'll ever do and pour out grace. Listen to what the Bible also says, Ephesians. I, this ain't Jonathan, to keep in mind. This is what God said, Ephesians 4, 31, 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be you kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. It is a shame that Jesus would come and he would die on that cross and he would go through what he went through for us to hate each other. For us to not be able to get along. For us to not be able to work together. It is a lying, crying shame. We are a family, or at least we're supposed to be. We are the bride of Christ. We are the children of God. And let me tell you what we are supposed to be doing. Pulling people out of hell, not throwing them in. There's a lot of people going to hell on their own. I'm going to tell you something right now. If we, and listen to me, when I say we, the church, what is the church? It ain't this building. It's sitting right here. It's us. If we, the church, are not united fighting the enemy and we're fighting ourselves, you know what's winning? Not heaven, hell. And I'm going to tell you something right now. Hell is fighting hard. But let me tell you, God equipped us with the gospel. He equipped us with some good news. And it's a crying shame that Jesus would go through all that and we not love each other. And help each other. And lift each other up. And encourage each other. Y'all, we ain't got to go hang out. We ain't got to go eat together. We ain't got to go play on the playground together. But we can fight for Jesus Christ together. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. This morning I want to ask you. Do you know that you know that you know that if you died right now, right this second, you say, heaven would be my home because you know where I shout out. Would you lift your hand? All over the room. I see those hands. Amen. Maybe you watching live, watching later, whatever the case may be. And you say, I just don't know. I hope so. I've done a lot of good things and, and I've tried. But what if you say, I just don't know for sure. Listen to me. The Bible is very clear. That if we will confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, we shall be saved. So right where you sit today, when you pray this prayer or something like it, just pray it from your heart. That's the main thing. Seek God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. And will you pray this prayer right now? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I realize that I am sinful. And Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, I'm even begging you, please forgive me of my sin. Lord, please come into my heart and save my soul. Lord, I want you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Nobody looking around. If you pray that, would you lift your hand? Anybody anywhere? I'm looking. Praise God. I see the hands. This morning, y'all, I want y'all to remember something. Remember this price. Remember this great price that was paid for you and me. Y'all, I'm going to tell you something right now. I believe, I believe in the blink of an eye, I believe real, real soon, real soon in the blink of an eye, this is over. 
I believe Jesus is coming right now. Israel and the wars going on over in the Middle East and the wickedness of the world and the technology of the world and, and everything that's adding up right now. I'm telling you, we are probably, we're, we're not even down to years anymore. Maybe months at most, but possibly days before Jesus comes back. And I'm telling you right now, there is nothing that I want to do more than to have Jesus come back while we're witnessing to somebody and maybe we're pulling that last one out of the fire. We're trying our best to save as many, to lead as many people as we can from the pits of hell. We are in a rescue mission right now. It ain't about me. It ain't about you. It ain't about us. It's about lost souls dying and going to hell. That's what it's about right now. For whatever reason, God put you and me right now for this time, for such a time as this. It's our time, y'all. God put us in this moment. And I'm telling you right now, we can do this. We can do it together. And we ain't perfect. And the enemy is real. But we got something greater. And we're not losing. Let's go get our friends and our family. Let's fight together. You're going to fight. We're going to fight. You're either going to fight against each other. Or we're going to fight together. I want to fight together, y'all. I want to let's mount up in the army of Jesus. And I want to see hell tremble when we come. Let's fight. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, bless us. Lord, help us. Lord, forgive us. And most of all, Lord, use us. Lord, we need you right now. Lord, we need you. Lord, we need you to move right now. Lord, we need you to do something incredible right now. Lord, we love you so much. And Lord, I pray right now that you would do something that only you could do. Lord, I pray right now that you would heal, that you would say, Lord, do it again. Lord, your word is full of so many times when we look defeated. But God, and Lord, I just pray right now that you would do it again. Lord, I pray right now that you would do something absolutely incredible to the point that we know it could only have been you. Bless us and help us as we open this altar. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody stand and this altar is open. This morning, if you want to be part of Woodland Baptist Church, you come. If you just need some prayer this morning, you come.